This is, this is Evolutionary Radio, continuing on our conversation about herbicides, in particular glyphosate. Today joining us is Stephen Renier of Blue Lagoon Organics. So Blue Lagoon Organics is a local organic farm here in Manitoba. They're someone I've been buying my produce from on a regular basis at the farmer's market. And I wanted to reach out to Stefan to get him to come on the show and really quantify what exactly organic, sustainable, local, all these terms mean. You know, a lot of us have heard these terms and aren't really sure on deciphering the difference between organic, hum humane, free range, natural, local, sustainable. Like we're throwing out all these terms and it's hard to decipher which actually means something, which don't mean something. So Stefan, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your farm, Blue Lagoon Organics, that is located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Well, some of our listeners are like Steve uh, in the U.S. You know, Steve thinks Winnipeg is part of French Canada. So give us a little bit of a geography for, for our listeners as well. Uh, okay, so we are right in the middle. Uh, so I'm actually from St. Francis Xavier, Manitoba, which is just um, it's 13 kilometers west of the city of Winnipeg. And uh, right in between St. Francis and Winnipeg is the ge geographical center of Canada. So we're right in the middle. We're about like, 150 kilometers north of the U.S. border. Yeah, uh, so it's a little bit north of North Dakota. So, so tell us right. a little bit about, um, you know, what is it that you guys basically provide? Is it just the farmer's markets or do you provide the supermarkets? Tell us a little bit about your, your business, first of all. Yeah, okay. Um, so we farm about uh, eight acres. We do about 100 different varieties of uh, fruits and vegetables. Some are perennial crops um, and some are uh, transplanted or seeded every year. Um, we uh, support uh, a CSA program, so community supported agriculture. So someone would buy a share at the beginning of the season and they would receive uh, a basket or a box of produce delivered to their house every week through the season. Um, it's a great way to experience the season in its truest form because uh, our goal uh, is to sort of pick produce at its peak. When you're sort of selling to stores or restaurants, they kind of want things when they want it. And it, be, it can become a little bit more difficult to hit those seasons perfectly. So what the CSA program does is allow us to uh, monitor a crop, watch it when it's at its peak, you pick it and it, it has customers already lined up. So that marketing aspect is really great. Um, yeah, farmer's markets, that'll be another one that uh, happens throughout the season. There is a farmer's market here in Manitoba that runs all year long. So uh, we have been in the last, I guess, three or four years focusing on more uh, storage crops and root crops that you can sell throughout the winter. Um, so actually growing seasons here in Manitoba usually end around uh, early November, depending on the weather, and then they'll start up you know, maybe early to mid May. And uh, yeah, so, mm -hmm. and we have a I greenhouse could, as well, so. I could tell people for a fact, United States, that about less than probably 5% of farmers markets actually have produce that are sold by local farms. It's all like imported from other countries and stuff. Is it the same way in Canada? Because I try to explain this to people and they don't seem to understand it because they think farmers market means it's actually farmers selling produce and it's Correct. not it's really just like right. a scam scam right so at the saint norbert farmers market uh that i'm in that is part of the the policy 100 percent of the produce that you sell uh you have to produce um there's an audit they come out to your farm they check what you're growing stuff like that um so there is a transparency there for the consumer not all farmers markets have that uh specification though as well so like anything, like all things, uh, if you can have an opportunity to meet your farmer and get to know them, um, yeah, it's far better. Um, and that's, that's part of it. I think that the farmer's market, the whole benefit is you do develop a relationship. Like there are uh, customers, a wide variety of customers that we have that come every single week, uh, 365 days out of the year, they're there on a weekly basis. And they do support local and they're, they're eating local. So they're changing what they eat as the seasons change. And, uh, you know, knowing your farmer is great because, um, you know, once, mm. they, once there is a relationship, you're able to. Yeah, go ahead, Stefan. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, so 
Yeah. So once you, uh, once you develop a relationship with a farmer, I mean, they'll give you the heads up on when something is really good or when it's fresher, or, or they'll let you know what things are coming and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's like if, you know, you go to a restaurant or a bar occasionally or, or very frequently, you know, the staff there will be able to tell you what are the good specials and you know what to order and things like that. So the frequency is, is pretty much, well, it's good in any business really. So, so this, one of our user questions, um, it's kind of a follow-up question and it kind of ties into what you're saying. They want to know that if they live in a colder climate, let's say an example up there in Winnipeg, we know it's a cold climate. Obviously you're not going to be able to grow mangoes. You're not going to be able to grow bananas. You're not going to be able to grow citrus. So in that situation, if someone wants an orange or wants a pineapple or wants a mango, um, how do they get it basically? Well, they're going to go to Safeway or Sobeys or uh, Food Fair or whatever. There's, I mean, they can go to Costco. They can do whatever they want to do. So um, there's no shortage of tropical fruit um, anywhere if they want to get it, you know. So okay. that's, yeah. Okay. You have a line over there uh, in, the, in the camera that just, we just Yeah. It. He, 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 <laughs> it looks like a big line. So yeah. basically, if you live in a cold climate, you're not going to be able to go to the farmer's market if it's local, actual, actual real farmer's market, not a bullshit farmer's market, and buy local stuff, obviously. And on the flip side, if you live in a tropical climate, you're not going to be able to go buy berries, for example. Is that, right. is that pretty much it? Yeah, as long as it's low. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, Manitoba, we can grow a lot of stuff here. Like, we'll still have raspberries and strawberries and Saskatoons. And, uh, you know, I mean, the thing is, too, we're limited, too. Uh, there are certain varieties of cherries you can grow, but we can't really grow stone fruit here. So peaches and uh, plums and stuff usually come from British Columbia or Ontario. Um, so it depends, too. Like, they're, in Canada, some people can grow. Uh, yeah, like British Columbia has, I think they're a, a zone nine right around Victoria there. So they can grow quite a bit of stuff, but there is no citrus or bananas available in Canada anywhere. Um, and I guess a lot of places in the U S too. I mean, you're not going to be able to, to grow bananas or whatever, if it's a full on farmer's yeah. market. Well, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of stuff is not even native to where they are. Anyway, people think citrus is native to Florida. It's not, it's native to Spain. It was brought over. It's actually citrus plants are actually not doing well anymore in Florida because of the global warmings. Because citrus plants need cold weather to get sweet. So actually, where I live, if I go pick an orange off a tree, it's going to taste bitter. It's not going to taste sweet because it just doesn't get cold anymore where I live. How's that affecting um, you guys? How's the weather changes affecting you guys as well? Well, that's one. So I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And yeah, definitely in the last 10, it's become more volatile. Uh, we get really hot. We get really cold. Um, so you're adjusting to like this year, we hardly got any rain. And that was one thing that was, uh, it was just very hot, dry, windy. So those conditions weren't really conducive to growing the types of things that do tend to grow well here, like a lot of the brassica crops, uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, those types of things. Um, they, they enjoy cool weather as well. Um, so, you know, and the insects too are staying either longer or they're coming more frequently or in greater numbers. So, um, yeah, the one thing about climate change is a, a lot of people have focused on, oh, wow, it's going to be hotter. This is going to be great for growing certain things. But it's the volatility that is going to be climate change. And it's, it's going to be when it does rain, it's going to just only rain. And when it doesn't rain, it's going to be, you know, a drought for extended periods. So, yeah, growing uh, fruits and vegetables, I think anywhere is going to become very, very complicated. I know Trevor wants to jump in, but I just have one more question to follow up on that. What about the bees? Because you hear a lot about the bees are dying out. Is that, right. is that, have you seen that? And if that does happen, let's say the bees were to get wiped out, like, would you still be able to grow stuff or would that be a problem? Yeah, so not, not everything uh, requires uh, pollinators. Um, there, I mean, it would affect, I think it's about 35 or 40% of the fruit crops for sure. Um, but, you know, some things like peppers, uh, corn, beans, these uh, types of flowers have both sexes within them. So they're sort of self-pollinating. Um, but yeah, a lot of the fun stuff would uh, quickly disappear for sure. So Stefan, my question was for a lot of our listeners who maybe never been to a farmer's market before and live in a northern climate like Winnipeg, how does the winter months work? Like right now it's January. Obviously you aren't growing anything. What would you be selling at the farmer's market? Uh, well, actually I've got radishes coming up in the greenhouse right now. So we've got a winter greenhouse that um, 
we've got heated beds in it. So I'll probably have radishes and turnips for early February and then lettuce is going to be following maybe mid to late February. Um, but yeah, at normal stuff that I would have would be garlic and onions, cabbage, uh, potatoes, um, beets, celeriac, parsley root, uh, dried herbs, and then there's uh, honey and uh, preserves, so pickled beets or carrots or cucumbers and stuff like that. That's really interesting. How is, do you think that's going to really be the future, this um, greenhouse growing like you're doing? Uh, well, I think the greenhouse growing is going to definitely be the future everywhere. Like even in Spain, you think of Spain and Spain has, it's just, you look at sky shots and it's incredible with just, you know, acres and acres of greenhouses and they're the breadbasket for uh, Europe. Um, Italy, the same thing. Like there's all of these climates where you think they don't need a greenhouse, but uh, greenhouses are just great for extenders. They're great for improving the quality of food. Um, because you can give a tomato, a tomatoes love 18 to 25 all the time and a greenhouse can provide that. So whether you're discussing an organic greenhouse, we grow in soil, um, uh, conventional greenhouses where you're growing more of a hydroponic situation where you're feeding nutrients through some sort of a rock wool or whatever. Um, either way, I mean, whatever the food or the nutrients are for the plant, uh, it's the conditions that the greenhouse provides that's the most important. Um, you can just extend seasons. You can start things earlier. Uh, you know, plants love a non-competitive environment. So the one thing that I think that produces really great food in a greenhouse is just the lack of wind. You don't have this volatile wind. So the plants just sit in, you know, you might have some fans to do a little bit of motion, but for the most part, the, the, the quality of, of the fruit, you'll really notice that the cucumbers, the skin won't be as thick. Uh, tomatoes, they'll just be nice and tender and soft and uh, perfect ripening. So, Stefan, I want to touch on livestock in a little bit. But first, let's talk about the economics of organics. We've had on quite a few experts come on the podcast and talk about glyphosate, which is the main herbicide in Roundup. And obviously, that is detrimental for our health. It's detrimental for the environment. But it makes for very efficient growing. As an organic farmer, are you finding it hard to compete with these non-conventional with these conventional farms? And then also, there's also big money in getting an organic certification. What are your thoughts on all the organic certification regulations, fees, things like that? Uh, so the organic, uh, as far as you know, there's 26 different uh, certifying bodies in Canada. Uh, you can choose. You can shop around for. Um, you can shop around for a certifier that, you know, sort of meets the, the needs of your farm the best. The regulations are all pretty much going to be the same, like there's a national standard. Uh, however, somehow times how they charge uh, will just fit with your profile better. If you're uh, a huge cereal uh, farmer and you're farming, you know, thousands of acres of organic grains and they charge you so much an acre or they charge you so much a, a, a section or a hectare, then maybe you'd want to go that way. Uh, we have changed certifiers recently because they were trying to, they were basically charging us by crop. And because we, tr we had about a hundred different crops, every time we'd have a question, there'd be another fee. And so it, it did get quite expensive. Uh, we're with EcoSir right now. They're very easy to work with. Um, you know, you might be looking at a couple thousand bucks in fees, but what most people don't like is sort of the, they don't like the paperwork. That's one of the biggest complaints. You need to uh, be recording what you plant, how much you plant, where you plant it, how much you sell. You have to have your books need to be presented uh, to the inspector as well. Uh, all of these things we found to be a little bit nuisance at the beginning, but then once we found that our record keeping is now immaculate, it actually makes your decisions a lot better. Um, for years, I really wanted to try and make money with sweet corn. And I mean, I was like, I'm gonna grow sweet corn. and after a couple of years of doing it, I realized there's really no money in it. It's just a big bulky crop and there's seasons for it and stuff. But, uh, you know, by having great records, I began to realize, you know what, there's really the money's in carrots. Why don't I just grow more carrots? Why don't I focus on this? Why don't I focus on that? So the fact that I had to keep the records, actually, uh, they've paid a dividend for sure. Like uh, all that record keeping does, it, it provides you with really great decisions. Don't keep records, Artie. Have you seen um, Casino, the movie Casino, the Mafia movie? The guy's like, don't keep records, Artie. What are you taking, keeping records for? For taxes? You know, yeah. that's, that's the thing. So I think a lot of the farmers, they want to kind of hide how much money right. they're making stuff for the tax, tax reasons and stuff. That's one of the big things. 
Um, right. So, so like, you know, before we dig too much deep into organic, if I asked one of my neighbors right now, like, you know, about organic food, they, they probably won't even know what organic is. So can you kind of dumb it down to people who are maybe a new to nutrition yeah. who don't know what organic is? I mean, because a lot of people don't know. Like if I asked my grandma what organic meant, she wouldn't know. Uh, well, actually, your grandma would know because your grandma, everything was organic when your grandma was around. So the exactly. Green Revolution really changed everything off. And that's the thing. Like, you have to remember organics is really nothing new. Um, it's what it always was for a long time. Uh, the Green Revolution started in the 70s. And by the time 1995, 96 rolled around, that's when uh, a lot of the genetically modified crops and genetically modified with the intention of using uh, Roundup. Uh, for control of weeds and um, stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of where the transition occurred. But uh, organics in a nutshell is, you know, you're beginning with an organic seed. Um, and essentially that is just an un unadulterated seed. Uh, no synthetic fertilizers, so no petroleum-based fertilizers. Uh, no herbicides or pesticides that are sort of chemical-based. Um, so organics really is about the soil, uh, healthy soil starting at that point. And um, so you solve problems as they are presented. So sort of a, a conventional farmer might say, well, if I'm a potato farmer, I'm going to have potato bugs. I'm going to apply this uh, dust product at these certain stages, period. Uh, whereas I think an organic farmer has to sort of look at the challenges as they come. So um, Instead of using, say, chemicals to manage a pest problem, you're going to try to put up physical barriers. So there's a product called Agribon. It's almost like a big coffee filter. It comes in long rows. You would put it out over top of your crop. Uh, for us in Manitoba, we plant a lot of canola on a big scale, so that attracts flea beetles. Flea beetles love brassicas, which the canola plant is a brassica. That affects the cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli and radishes and all that stuff. So you can put uh, that netting over top of those young seedlings and, uh, you know, that'll physically keep the bugs off of those crops. Uh, it's then beneficial against, you know, cabbage looper and all kinds of other insects as well. Um, so you're looking at, with plant management, you're looking at fertilizing in uh, a natural, fertilize, uh, natural fertilizer. So basically uh, animal manure worked into, uh, into the land. You can look at we changed agriculture in, this, in, in the idea that, you know, uh, that wasn't even 100 years ago, but 50 years ago, everything was a mixed farm. So farms had, they grew plants, they grew animals, they grew uh, hay or grain, they fed that to the animals and, and so on and so forth and went back and forth. And then we basically broke up the small farm and we created, a, we took a solution and created two problems. So everybody grows corn and then everybody grows either pigs, chickens or cows. And they're feeding that corn to the animals. And what you have is, is corn is a very heavy feeder. So you have a, a vegetable crop that's in dire need of nutrients. And then you have these hog operations or chicken operations or cattle operations that have an excessive amount of nitrogen that they don't know what to do with. Whereas before, you would manage these two together. You would basically plant corn where you once ran pigs, chickens, or cows, and so on and so forth. And... Uh, you know, that's part of the problem. So that's where organics does come back is trying to integrate the idea of animals and plants together. Um, trying to come up with, I mean, you can fertilize with plants as well. So there's, you've probably heard of legumes. So you'll have things like alfalfa or beans. You can plant that crop. It'll actually fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, put it into the soil, and then you would follow. So even conventional farmers still use a rotation of working legumes in to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil and then it would go back into the plant. So I just, I like to look at organics like a full circle. Uh, you're basically going from plant to animal back to plant and that's kind of, uh, that's the focus. And what are the health benefits of organics? This is another user question. They want to know, they were specific, they said for the physique, but I mean, obviously, you know, this isn't a, we're not really focused on that, but like from a health benefit, because if you're not healthy, you're not gonna have a good physique, you know, um, long okay. term on at least so from a right. health perspective tell us the difference between organic and non-organic uh well you kind of hit the nail on the head with the glyphosate glyphosate so you're not going to have that uh integrated into organic food but um you know i mean 
you'd have to look at, it's still going to come down to uh, healthy soil and uh, the carbohydrates that are produced uh, within the food. So there's a bricks meter. You can actually test the fruit and see how many bricks are in it. Uh, you're actually, how much energy you're getting out of that food. Um, healthy soil will provide that. Um, as far as organics goes, um, the food does tend to take longer to grow, which will then allow more times for um, micronutrients and nutrients to develop within the food. So you can get a, a healthier product that way. Um, well, I'm not, let me stop you right there. Let's say you're, um, you go somewhere, whatever, and you see this huge tomato that looks like perfect, and you see right next to it, some, like a puny tomato. Would, would I be wrong to assume that that big, huge tomato was not organic, but the little tomato that kind of looked funky was organic? Would that be kind of proof, like, hey, that big ass tomato probably isn't gonna grow, because you just, like you just said, it's gonna grow slower. Is, uh, that, no. is that wrong? Yeah, well, that, yeah, that can be wrong. Like tomatoes, there's there's thousands of varieties of tomatoes. And I mean, we had a Sicilian saucer where they are large tomatoes and you have to almost tie up the tomatoes and figure out a way of so sorting them out. But I mean, they were in excess of a kilogram. So, I mean, we're talking about, you know, well over two pounds for tomatoes. So, and that was organically grown and organic uh, variety. So tomatoes are a tough one. And then you can have a tomato as small as a cherry tomato, right? So, um yeah, the main, the, the, main, the main benefit to organic isn't actually what it has, but what it doesn't have. So the problem with all these herbicides and pesticides is that they're antimicrobial because they want to kill the bacteria, the viruses, things that would, you know, obviously eat the crop, the pests and things like that. The problem is that when you're consuming these herbicides and pesticides, they kill the microbiome in your stomach. And that's why so many people now are having food sensitivities, food allergies, irritable bowel syndrome, which isn't even... Irritable bowel syndrome isn't even a thing. It's basically you have digestive issues and the doctor doesn't know what's wrong with you. So they just slap you with the term irritable bowel syndrome. It's not actually a disease. It's a symptom. So the first pesticide ever used, because what Stefan says is actually really true. Pesticides and herbicides are very new. They, haven't, they weren't actually used in traditional agriculture until after the Second World War. What happened after the Second World War is that we needed crop because we had basically all these um, people coming back to North America from the war and insects were a problem. So they, what, what they used was DDT. So what they would did is they would spray DDT, uh, which is a powerful insecticide on all the army guys, like their ammo and whatever, so that bugs wouldn't you know, attack them when they're in trenches and things like that. So then they basically had the great idea, hey, if DDT prevented you know, maggots and things like that in the trenches from attacking our war guys, why don't we spray that on our crops? That's got to kill all the insects. And that's basically how conventional agriculture started is after the second world war. So we've only been using herbicides and pesticides for 40 years. It's pretty new, like Stefan said. Um, yeah. I mean, to touch on that too, I mean, it was the same companies that were making a lot of the chemical warfare uh, that then went into agriculture. And I mean, it's the same, <laughs> the same principle, right? Um, like agent orange was used for, um, in Vietnam, they used it to, they couldn't find the soldiers in the, in, they couldn't find the enemies in, in the jungle. So let's get rid of all the leaves. So they came out with Agent Orange, which then defoliated all the trees. They realized, oh, that works great when we're, all the leaves on a cotton plant are getting in our way here. If we spray it on cotton, it'll, then we're just left with the top. And so, you know, they just basically applied uh, warfare uh, from the battlefield, basically to an agricultural field. And, uh, that's kind of where we're at. Like it is, it is a big, it is a big. Battle. And now there's a bunch of lawsuits on Roundup um, that now they're saying it causes cancer. It's like no shit, it causes cancer. You're just not figuring mm -hmm. that out. Yeah. Really? It took yeah. you all these years to figure that out. Yeah, and I mean Roundup is is quite effective. Like it basically starves the plant. So um, I think when they first, uh, it wasn't trademarked as Roundup yet. But what it basically did was it was a demineralizer. So it, they, it, they were able to clean uh, minerals off of steel. And uh, so basically what it does is it just blocks the uptake of nutrients to the plant. So it works quite quickly. So you just spray it on the plant. The plant can take up nutrients and it dies. It's pretty simple. Uh, but you got to wonder, like, well, yeah, once that's in our gut, what is that doing? And uh, does it pose a, a longer-term a longer problem? So Stefan, one question I have for you, and I think this is something all of our listeners have wondered, is that 
when you go to Costco, you go to Safeway, you go to Sobeys or whatever, and you're in the produce section and there's organic apples and there's regular apples and right beside each other, how confident are you that when you buy the organic apples, they're actually organic and it's not, you know, just some kid who's, you know, got a part-time job at the produce stand and he goes, ah, screw it. I'll just put these in the organic section. Who, who's going to know? Right. Uh, well, I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, that's part of it. I mean, most of the grocery stores that I will go to, most of the organic stuff is bagged. It's either bagged or separated and, and bundled. It's, you know, the bananas are tied separately. Like it is, if they do have loose apples, usually each one has a sticker on it. So there's that kind of a segregation. But, um, you know, I think that that's the biggest problem when you go to the grocery store. Because if you do ask someone in the produce department, they have no idea what you're talking about. You'll ask, is it local? And they're like, yeah, sure, it's from Mexico. You know, like it's, it's North American. So there is there is a real disconnect um, at this point. So that's another, that's why I throw that argument out there to to sign up for a CSA as well as like, if you want, if anybody wants to come out to the farm, take a look, see what we're doing at any point in the season, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. And it is over years developing trust and developing relationships with our customers. So um, I do recommend that, you know, go to a farmer's market and there are markets and then there's farmer's markets and farmer's markets usually has the farmer present. That's a real great opportunity for people to go and ask questions get to know, get to know your farmer. I mean, we're living in a society right now where you have therapists and you have physiotherapists and you have your personal trainer and you've got your uh, dentist and your doctor. Like why don't people have farmers and why don't they have their own farmer? Why don't you have a farmer that specializes in tomatoes? Like I go to that guy for my cucumbers. I go to that guy for my chicken. So um, we're, we're living in a time right now where it, 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 and most people are pretty accessible through social media or, just pick up a phone. So I'm just scared of farmers because I, when I think of a farm, I think of a guy wearing the overalls and he's got like a big shotgun. And if you go on his territory, he's like going to shoot you. I'm well, oh, yeah, okay, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Maybe, okay. <laughs> maybe make a phone call. Maybe make a phone call first. But that's what I'm saying. Meet them at the farmers market. I'm pretty sure, at least in Canada, they won't have a shotgun at the farmers market. So that's maybe a good place to start. And then uh, you know, see if you can set up a visitor. You'd like to come out and and uh, and get to know them, but. Um, yeah, I mean, most, most farmers are usually pretty, pretty willing to talk about what they do and how they do it. I actually most, was on a, I was on a strawberry farm and I asked the farmer there, I was like, I'm like, is it, are these strawberries organic? And he just flat out told me, he's like, we are a conventional farm. He, he didn't yeah. bullshit, he didn't lie to me. He just yeah. told me straight up, Hey, we're a conventional farm and you want to buy my strawberries, buy them, you know? So yeah. I don't think they're going to lie to you if you just go, go ask, you know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. I've had really good experiences at the farmer's market. You know, the farmers, um, they're completely honest. You know, if you say, hey, is this organic? A lot of them will say, no, it's not organic. You know, we had a insect outbreak of whatever. I had to use one or two herbicides. Um, or they'll say, you know what, we're not certified organic, but we follow organic principles. Or they'll say, yes, we're certified organic. You know, we've been growing organic for over 20 years. Someone like Stefan's farm. It's, it's a really cool experience, especially if you have kids. I think it's very, very important to educate kids, you know, where our food comes from. A lot of kids don't even know eggs come from chickens. Like it's really, really upsetting. And what blows my mind is that people are willing to spend, you know, 50 bucks for a probiotic, 50 bucks for digestive enzymes, 50 bucks for some prebiotic. You know, they got all these different, you know, or even just like pharmaceuticals, like Tums, Rolaids, all these sorts of things. But an organic apple is a dollar and a non-organic apple is 50 cents. Like, Oh my, no, there's, I'm, I'm putting my foot down. Organic is outrageously expensive. I just, it's never, I've never understood it. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I think you do have to, you have to look at, I think that there was a bigger schism before. I mean, uh, when we look at our prices, um, they're really not that much higher than conventional food. Um, and I mean, the, when you go to a farmer's market, one of the nice things you're, you're going to get feedback, like in the spring when we have lettuce, some people will say, uh, your lettuce lasts so long in the fridge, it's so incredible. Like it's been in there for weeks and it still looks great. I'm, I don't know why they haven't eaten it after a couple of weeks. But anyway, um, the only real difference you're going to have is like when food is being shipped from California out to Canada, you're looking at weeks in, in transport, you know, so it's not as if the food that's produced in a local setting is so much uh, better than in, uh, it, it's just that you've basically that, that two weeks was basically just in a truck 
in a truck, in a storage uh, house, then it all gets rotated through. So the stuff that you get at a farmer's market, I don't know if it's going to be picked that day. That's usually pretty rare, but it'll be certainly picked within the last couple of days or, you know, the day before they get ready to go to the market. And uh, that's something that's quite incredible uh, that you can have something that was picked, you know, the day before and you have access to something that's that fresh. Let me ask you, um, you know, we see, a, I'm very lucky because there's a lot of organic, um, I have a lot of organic uh, places where I live. I live in a very, you know, educated, wealthy part of the world. So I kind of get it. Like if you live in the middle of fucking Oklahoma, you, you know, you're probably going to have to drive like a hundred miles to, to find an organic place. So I mean, that aside, like what is the, obviously like with organic, we know um, that the more educated, the more wealthy, the, the more health freaks are buying organic. That's why Whole Foods will actually put a Whole Foods in the middle of a place like that. In your experience though, is that kind of accurate or is that kind of a myth? And like, what is your biggest kind of demographic that's buying organic, that's starting to go to organic? Is it someone who maybe had cancer and they're like, you know what, I'm going to clean up what I'm eating. So, Hey, let me start eating organic. Have you had anyone like that approach you? Like what is the, what is the kind of the demographic that you're noticing? That, that's a big part of it. When people do start having gut issues and uh, maybe they're going through, unfortunately they're going through chemo or something. Um, they do want to start eating more organic. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of late in the, in the situation to be, to be starting. But uh, as far as the demographic goes, it's really, really broad. Um, it's, it's not necessarily only affluent people. It's people that have made a choice that, you know, they're willing to spend, uh, depending on how that, like, they don't necessarily find that they have to have the newest iPhone or they don't have to have, uh, you know, they don't have to spend $900 on a bag or something. So, that's, they've just made choices to spend money in, in different areas. So uh, sometimes it's not necessarily that they have lots of money. It's just that they're disposable money. They choose to spend it on good food. And, and that's, that's part of the, the customer base too. So one really cool thing that Blue Lagoon Organics does is they have a community share option. I know the acronym CSA. I don't know. What does the A stand for? Uh, agriculture. Yeah. Community share agriculture. Okay. So basically how this works is, you spend however much money um, for Blue Lagoons, I think it was $850. And then for 20 weeks, they drop off, they deliver it to your door, a box of produce every week. So it's very affordable. It's less than $50 a week for all of your produce. Um, I signed up because one problem I was having, and I, I think I spoke to your mom, I was at the farmer's market and I said, you know, like, I would love to buy more produce from you guys. The problem I have is that I'm generally working Saturday morning, um, you know, I have other commitments, things like that for a lot of our listeners, you know, who maybe have kids and Saturday morning is soccer practice time or, or whatever community shares, how popular are these becoming? And then talk to us about how this works. Uh, well, um, that's kind of, you, you kind of had it there. So like specifically what we do for that, we do a, a 15 box program, which takes place 15 weeks called the summer program. It'll basically just be produce. Um, the 20 box program that you're part of is going to take place over 25 weeks. So it's the same, uh, 15 boxes you'll get through the summer season. And then the last five boxes will be staggered. So you'll get it every, uh, two weeks for the last, uh, 10 weeks. And, uh, you're going to get to try the pastured poultry. So there'll be a chicken in the box. There's going to be, you can add on eggs too, if you want. So we do pastured poultry as well. Um, there'll be more preserves. Uh, the box is going to be more geared towards uh, reflecting the whole season. So uh, during raspberry season, you make it raspberries. And then if there's a surplus, we'll make jams. So then you may get to try the raspberry jam later on in the season or hot sauce or pickles or, um, so there's all of, uh, there's, there's that aspect of it as well. It's just trying to reflect more of uh, more of a season because um, a lot of times people, and that's, I mean, I think that this is anywhere. There's, there's a season of abundance and a lot of times people will not, there'll be more of the, more of the grasshopper and less of the ant. And when that you have this abundance in that season, you want to start squirreling some of that away. You want to be the ant where you're actually preparing for later and you're, you're pickling or you're freezing or you're drying or you're, uh, you're canning, you're doing whatever you can to preserve all that stuff for later. And uh, so the extended box program kind of reflects a little bit of the later. 
And um, as far as other CSAs go, I mean, yeah, there's, you really do need to shop around. There's a lot of different, sometimes they'll do longer or less. You can do 15 boxes or 18 or 20 or whatever you're going to do. And then sometimes you'll get meat shares in it uh, if they have a mixed farm as well. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answered the question or not. Anyway. I, I've seen these before um, and I went and talked to someone about that and he kind of like, I didn't really like get into it more, but like, are, as you, are you, am I, would I be able to pick my produce or would I be yeah. able to help grow? Would I be able to help water and have be a part of it? Or do I just show up and get a basket full of produce every however? Right. So almost all of those things are possible. Um, we do have some people that don't like uh, certain things or they can't eat certain things. So they'll just give us an indication of that at the beginning of the season. And then we'll try and customize those boxes. But for the most part, the boxes are all going to be exactly the same. Some people do like i I've heard of CSAs where they do a points program. So you go out, maybe it's like a big shop set up or it's at a farmer's market and for, it's going to be first come first serve, but uh, you know, you can fill your box with all of one thing if that's what you want to do. Uh, if that's what you like, um, everything is on sort of a, you know, you get this much by weight or count or however it's going to work. Uh, for us, we just kind of do one, one box kind of fits all. Um, and that's going to be the box for the week. Um, so I can't go there and pick my own. I like to pick the thing off the, the plant for some reason. It kind of like, right. And so you know, say we, it, I kind of get an enjoyment out of that. I like to pick like, especially like berries and stuff. That's fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've, <laughs> we've had, so uh, yeah, as far as if anyone wants to come out and plant or weed or harvest or whatever, yeah, we encourage that. Um, I mean, the thing is, uh, I mean, I've had some, I've had, a, I, well, I've had a lot of stories over the years, but I mean, you know, you have to be taught how to pl how to pick some things. Steve, like Steve, Steve, he's kind of just breaking your balls. He's not being No, 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 that's not true. We have, well, we have to pick I, your own I stuff. think I do know what you're talking about, but yes, some people do want to come out and have a more hands-on approach. And then, yeah, definitely that's, that is welcome as well. Um, I mean, a lot of times people have to be supervised because if you don't know how to pick beans, for example, you might just rip the whole plant out of the ground. And, uh, so that tends to be, that tends to be something, but, um, my, yeah, as my far grandfather as owns uh, an acreage in Kelowna. I okay. think if you go once and you see how much work it is. You'll be like, okay, I'm good with you guys. Just, uh, just dropping it off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, so there, there is that good experience though. Cause it really does teach you a lot about food and it teaches you about how much work is involved. And it really makes you respect the farmer that, you know, he's doing that every single day and, and he's, you know, basically feeding you. Um, yep. So I would encourage people, you know, to go up the farm and check it out. And I mean, I do encourage uh, members to come out as well, because even if you come out, say, say you come out uh, three times throughout the season and you, you maybe you, you, you spend an afternoon in the greenhouse, say in April, and you're helping us transplant or something. And you actually, you know, you've repetitively transplanted all these little celery plants. And then maybe you come out later in May or June and you, put that celery into the ground uh, or you come out later on and you weed around it. When you get that celery plant in your box later on in August, you're going to have a kinship with that plant. You remember it when it was, and now you're cooking with it. It's very, that's the one thing that you can never put a price on like that. Uh, mm -hmm. That connection that you're going to have is, is remarkable. And, and for me, like that's how I got into farming was my background was cooking. And I mean, uh, I love it. I mean, for me, my favorite job of all jobs is harvesting for sure. And that moment of, okay, what am I going to do with this? And that walk, walk back. And I mean, um, it's for, for a cook having a farm like we have is, is absolutely amazing because, oh, there's just stuff everywhere. Like there's an inspiration everywhere you look. Stefan, talk to us a little bit about livestock. So you go to the grocery yeah. store, you see organic, you see humane, you see free sure. rain, you, sure. see, you know, <clears throat> So for, menu, air chilled, what does that all mean? Right. Okay. So, uh, well, the air chilled and the water chilled, that's, that's almost as exactly what you think. So if you're going to be chilling uh, a chicken from, uh, you're going to plunge it into ice water, you're going to just air chill it, air chilling it, the fresh chicken is going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be quite as watery. Uh, it will be, I, I do think that air chilled is probably a little bit better if you're going to pick those two, but there's no nutritional difference there at all. Um, as far as say eggs, for example, you've got, um, caged, which they don't actually write caged. That's basically any egg that doesn't say anything is probably caged. 
there's a very interesting thing in Canada now that I've noticed. They call it enhanced housing. Uh, that means caged. Uh, what they've done is they put a bar inside the cage so the chicken can go from the bottom of the cage and can sit in the center of the cage, and that's enhanced housing. So you want to look out for that nonsense. Uh, there's free run, which basically means that there's no cage. So if you buy eggs that are free run, that means that the chickens are in a barn and they can at least go wherever they want. And it's usually a multi-leveled system where they've got all these nesting boxes and there's ground space and chickens are everywhere. Then there's free range. That indicates that the chicken has to have access to outside. So organic standards, pretty much all chickens are free range because you have to have uh, doors on the barn where the chickens are allowed to go outside should they choose to. The chickens are so many different breeds of chickens. Most of the, the, the leghorns, for example, that's 99% of all layers, they probably won't go outside. They could care less about it. They just, they like to be six feet from a building. That's the way they've been bred. But free range will allow the chickens to go outside. So what we have is there's another term called pastured, which now that's the ultimate. So that's your, the chicken is actually out on grass and we're moving the chicken. So for the meat birds, for example, they're in a, in a, in a, it's kind of like a big cage. You can walk inside, it'll house about 50 chickens and it's got an open bottom. So the, it's got shades, walls, food, waters all in there, but they're going to eat the profile of the bottom. So we've got them on an alfalfa field or we'll have them on maybe a spent cabbage field or something. And the, the unit is actually going to be moved. So when they're small chickens, you might only move it once a day. When they get older, you'll move them in the morning, then you might move them before lunch. And then as their, their last two weeks or so, you may move them in the morning, the afternoon, and later in, in, in the, before the evening. And they're actually eating a living plant. And so that profile that they've created, so if the, if the unit is say 12 by 10 feet, that's now this maximum fertilized little spot for next year. So what you're gonna do after you go through this, you know, thousand feet of moving these chickens, you're gonna have this template of fertility where you're gonna put in a cover crop, say uh, just a quick little clover or something, you're gonna till that in and then you can plant horticulture. In Canada, that's gonna be next year. We don't have multiple seasons, the winter, everything is kind of on a kibosh. But so our egg layers that are on pasture, we actually have a, a the barn is on wheels. It's a big flatbed trailer. It houses about 300 chickens and their nesting boxes and perches are inside, but we open the doors and have an electric netting around to protect them, and they can just free range. So they can just go outside, uh, but you're moving the barn. So that's a whole other uh, way of doing it, where you're taking the chickens to the plants. You're not bringing plants to the chickens, and that's a big difference. They're actually eating a living plant versus eating hay or grain or, or whatever. What about during the winter? Yeah, so... <laughs> For us, we still have them out there. So they're out in, a, in an area. It's, it's pretty cold today. They're not going to go out. But if it's about, uh, even if it's like minus five Celsius, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Um, but, you know, minus five, they'll go outside. I mean, some of them won't, but a lot of them want to go outside for a little while to check it out. Um, another thing with organics is there is a stipulation where the animals need to be able to exhibit their natural behavior. So it's pretty simple. So when it comes to pigs, they need to be able to root around. Uh, cows, they need to be able to go out on grass. Chickens, they need to be able to perch. They need to be able to, to forage. They need to be able to uh, exhibit their natural behavior. So that's part of uh, organic meat is usually running a system around those parameters. Um, so you want a happy animal, basically. Is it true, like, I know you don't do it, but is it true some farms, they actually chop the, the chickens a beak off so they can't pet, they can't peck? Right. So, yeah, so that's, uh, they laser the beak off. So they, well, and see, this is, this is where it gets crazy, right? And there's, you know, those farms where they'll crop the tail of the pig and you're looking, they're looking at the problem, but they're, they're sort of just looking at the symptom of the problem. Like uh, a chicken is probably taking that sharp beak and pecking another chicken because there's just too many chickens in one spot. So it's the density that's causing this behavioral issue and part of that being cooped up. So allowing the chickens to go outside, giving them more density. You can pack a chicken in a barn at night when they're sleeping. It doesn't really matter. You can have all this perch space and they'll all just crowd together and they're all sleeping like they'll all huddle up. But during the day, they're quite active and yeah, give them space to move around. Pigs, it's the same thing. The reason they're cropping that tail is because they're... There's a, a head of a pig and then a butt of a pig and they're so packed in that barn, what is it going to do? It's going to bite the tail off the pig in front of it. 
So they're kind of, they're, they're preemptively doing these things, but the, the problem is actually just a symptom of another problem, which is, you know, you can't put that many animals in no. together. It boils down to profit and greed, and it, it's sick uh, the way, uh, you know, we treat animals. So I, do, yeah. I, I, I applaud you as a, as a farmer who actually, you know, respects the animals, and that's how it should be. The Native Americans used to only kill what they were going to eat, and now you have these, these bozos going around with their guns, shooting animals, and just leaving the animal to die. And that shit pisses yeah. me off, because I'm a fisherman. I see someone catch a fish and just leave it to die yeah. that that shit pisses me off so that that's you know shame on them these are psychopathic people they shouldn't even mm -hmm. be farming so but right. uh, uh, yeah go ahead mm -hmm. uh well yeah basically uh you know for for us like the 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 meat birds and the egg birds uh, the layers are two different breeds um but the idea for us is like these chickens are producing, we're feeding them organic grains, they're eating organic pasture, and the idea is they're creating a fertility down the road for us. So, um, I mean, you know, we have supply management in Canada with eggs, uh, chicken, and, uh, and dairy. And so there's a, a limited amount you can, you can produce outside of the quota system. So for us, we're bound by 999 meat birds and we're bound by 299 laying hens. Uh, operating outside of the quota system and so for us that's not really you can't really devise a business on that but the amount of birds we have it's perfect for us to have as a fertility uh, program so even if I don't really make any money on selling the the meat for example or selling the eggs they're part of uh, our fertility uh, program so they're making better tomatoes in the future they're making bigger cauliflower all of those types of things Stefan, one question I have for you, and one question I've got a lot of listeners asking as well, is that when you go to the grocery store, let's say you go to Costco and you see organic, gra organic ground beef, can you be certain that that organic beef is grass-fed? Like, because that's another issue we're having is that cattle now are being fed corn and soy, which is not their natural environment, which is making them fart up a storm, which is uh, releasing methane, and it's destroying the ozone layer. You know, same thing with chicken. You know, chicken are fed organic soy and things like that where chicken should be fed you know green and they should be out rummaging and eating alfalfa exactly like you said so just because something's organic does that necessarily mean that the animal was fed its proper diet uh yeah so i think i i guess i had mentioned before that uh with organic standards uh an animal needs to be able to exhibit its natural behavior so um grass-fed beef i would say that most cows are grass-fed like that that is pretty much fact. But how it, a cow is finished is the different story. So finishing a cow on grass may take an extra six months, whereas they may be able to finish it on grain to get that fat, to get that weight a lot faster. Um, and I mean, they've done study after study where, you know, if you were, because yeah, cows are not uh, meant to, to eat grain exclusively or corn. However, if you were to think about there is no natural cow, but if you were to think about a natural cow, there would be points in its lifetime where it would be eating grain as well. So if it's eating grass, there's gonna be a period where the grass goes to seed and there would be grains uh, available in a pasture for that cow to eat grain. So it's not uh, completely unnatural for it to eat grain, but it's the concentration and just the frequency of, of exclusively eating grain that gives it an unhealthy gut and, and sort of sends it down this other path. But grass-fed uh, cows, yeah, like, just because it's organic doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be grass fed either. And uh, just because it's grass fed doesn't mean it's organic and vice versa. Like it's uh, grass fed is a thing. Um, a lot of people, you know, I mean, all cows were grass fed, I think probably up into the sixties and seventies anyway, they, they, you know, that was something that they realized, what are we going to do with all this corn we're growing, feeding it to cows. But it did create a lot of marbling uh, or, well, I don't know about te specifically more tender, but an easier product to cook. So some people will go out and they'll buy grass-fed beef and they'll be very disappointed because, you know, it was dry or it, you know, it wasn't as palatable as I was used to. So there is different cooking methods that you're going to have to apply to grass-fed versus grain-fed. But grass-fed is definitely a healthier animal uh, without, without a doubt. Um, chicken, uh, chickens do need to eat grain. I mean, they've, they're a remarkable creature where they actually have a gizzard inside 
before their crop. So they'll actually eat stones. It's a, it's a muscle that actually contains grain and stones. And it's like a mill. They have a built-in grain mill inside the chicken. And uh, so they're, they're designed to eat grain and grass. And, and if you see a, a chicken out there, they're like a little velociraptor. I mean, they will take out anything on a pasture. Like they will chase down insects or small rodents. Uh, I've got a video on Instagram about one of our roos, our roosters took out a garter snake. I mean, it's like they're, they're quite aggressive little hunters too. So that's what I love about having them on pastures. You know, you'll see chickens with vegetable based diets. Well, I mean, a vegetarian uh, chicken is the furthest thing actually from a vegetarian. It's clearly an omnivore. Um, it's an opportunist as well. But um, yeah, I mean, what it eats is going to depend on, it's going to, you know, sort of uh, determine how it's going to taste as well. So I got an uncomfortable question, but this is something I asked another person who was on, who was a farmer and she wouldn't answer this. So I'll ask you, okay. um, yep. a cow, um, so when we're eating a steak, whatever, obviously it came from a cow. <laughs> how, how long, how old is the cow when they usually um, kill the cow? Oh, well that, okay. So that kind of depends. Um, but usually like, Till it gets to market weight. So that's part of the grass fed will I think be maybe six months older, but probably 18 months to two years old. That's it. Okay. And how long do they usually already do they live like their life expectancy? Yeah, so I mean, okay. So it depends on what you're doing with the cows now. So if you have cows that are going to make cows or cows that are going to be eaten, uh, if you have a, a great cow, um, you know, genetically, she's a wonderful cow. She's probably going to give you about, they're only going to have one cow. So they're going to have one cow every year. Uh, she might give you eight or nine cows in her lifetime. And then uh, at nine years old, um, she would probably then be considered an old cow. And then that's going to be ground beef or whatever. Now, there's a video that I just watched, which was quite interesting. And these guys were talking about steaks. And they had, uh, they had a one-year-old, a two-year-old, and I think it was like a 10-year-old cow. And they were talking about these steaks, almost like you talk about wine. Now, cooked properly, once again, they said that that old cow was amazing. The depth of flavor and that rich, meaty flavor was so amazing. Uh, but you do have to, and I think they were all ribeyes, so it's a pretty good steak to cook. I mean, pretty easy. But um, I think for risk of, you know, it tasting like an old cow, they usually older cows are just going to be ground beef i mean that's pretty much I think, standard what they're going to so do. i mean so a cow usually lives like probably maybe nine or ten years old but they're killing it at two so really it'd be like killing a human as a child right i mean it'd be like killing a human when they're a teenager for example right yeah is that like do you think that that's humane or do you think hey you know this is wrong well that's okay so that's where we're at yeah. You, and, how, you can, and how do they kill the, the cow? Is it, is it a humane? Do they kill the cow like humanely? Do they chop off its head? How does that work? Uh, well, I don't raise cows. Uh, I probably would not be the one to speak about that. I, I could talk about chickens. Um, I mean, chickens, for example, um, you know, for us, it's 12 weeks. That's actually how long it takes to have a chicken harvested or it's, um, you know, it's, it's basically a six pound chicken. Uh, it's probably only going to take us about 12 weeks. I mean, when you're looking at some of the conventional farms now, you're looking at 35 days to 40 days uh, for a chicken. So most of the operations we have, these are for smaller chickens, usually fryers. Um, you know, you're about three pound chicken, but that's eight weeks. So you're going to have a chicken house at seven and a half weeks. They have the same company that sold you the chicks and sold you the feed is going to come pick up the chickens. You have about three days to clean out the barn. They come back, they drop off chicks on on your eighth week and you start that whole thing again and you do that all year long. That's the chicken business. So uh, the animals can grow quite quickly. And so, I mean, if you think about nature though too, I mean, it's, it's the young and the old that get eaten. I mean, that's how it works too. So I don't know if it's a, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you, you answered it good. Steve, uh, yeah. Steve just kind of trying to give you a tough question. We yeah. kind of do the same thing. Like, if you think about it, we recruit people for the NHL, the NFL. They're 18, 19, 20. We play them for five seasons, and then they're screwed the rest of their life because they got it. <laughs> but we don't eat them, Trevor. I'm just trying to – because I love animals. I do eat meat, but I love mm. animals so much. I'm just trying to find a justification – 
to eat animals like you know and well you know. i i think if if we're going to solve a lot of the big problems that we're talking about moving forward it's going to be through eating animals like um we have to manage plants and animals together a lot better i think that we have screwed up agriculture in the last 30 years by removing by breaking up the small farm and uh you know like i said before about having you know millions of acres of corn that's a heavy feeder that's planted all across the United States. And then you have these CAFOs, these concentrated animal feeding operations, where you have all of this manure, you have all of this, these lagoons, these, you have all this fertilizer, and it's now a problem because you don't know what to do with it. Meanwhile, if you would have had the cows naturally spread out on a farm, uh, there's some really great videos you can watch about pigs and corn. And they'll actually have a field of corn and they rotating. They're almost always planting corn and harvesting it. It was in Chile and the pigs eat the corn and you just basically move these pigs around this corn. And so at different stages, when the corn's mature, you move the pigs in there and then the pigs fertilize and then you go back in there, you till and you plant more corn. And it's just, it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship with plants and animals. One more question I have for you, Stefan, and then I'll close up the show is that when you go to the grocery store, right? And you see organic, a lot of that organic is imported from Mexico. It's imported from the United States. It's imported from South America. Do they have the same regulations as Canada? Um, and then especially, you know, like I'm even seeing organic from China now, which I think is kind of weird, you know, that that's yeah. the other side of the planet. Why are they importing stuff from China? When I buy organic, can I be certain that that imported Mandarin oranges that are organic from China, does that still have the same organic certification regulations as here in Canada? It has, it has a certification, but it won't necessarily have the same standards. Like, so there are national standards and uh, yeah, those are all different. Um, like there's some really weird shit that happens out there where there's a lot of chemical companies that produce chemicals that are no longer allowed to be applied here in Canada or in the United States, but the companies, the chemical companies still exist. And there are markets where you can sell those chemicals for agriculture. So we're still then importing the food from a country that is allowing those chemicals to be applied, even though we've made the chemical, sold it to another country. Now we're importing the food back. We know that that is detrimental to our health, and yet it's now coming in the back door, and there's, then it's, it's, it's fine. So, uh, yeah, so as far as, you know, uh, know your farmer, man. That's all I can say. Uh, I can't speak on behalf of the world for how they produce organic, but it's usually follow the money. And yeah, if there's money that can be made, there's all kinds of things that will happen. But Stefan, where can our listeners find out more about you and about your farm? Uh, I'm trying to be more active on Instagram. So Blue Lagoon Organics, um, check me out. And uh, if I ever see something, if I ever see an image that I think is cool, I usually just I upload it and I'll talk a little bit about it. So um that's probably the easiest place. And if you are in Winnipeg, you can find Stefan in Blue Lagoon Organics every single week at the St. Norbert's Farmer's Market. Right on. Yeah. Cool. Stefan, I really appreciate you doing your show. Um, this is a really, really interesting episode. Anyone in Winnipeg, I encourage you guys to go to the St. Norbert's Farmer's Market. Check out Stefan's booth. And I mean, it's a great experience. Even if you can't go every week, try to go maybe once every couple of weeks, once a month. It's 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 fun. It's fun for the whole family. They got stuff for the kids. Um, it, it's an enjoyable experience. For your host, Robert Kuritsen, for my co-host, Steve Smee, and for our special guest, Stefan Regne of Blue Lagoon Organics, this has been another episode of Evolutionary Radio. Live your life, look good doing it. Thank you for listening.